Whenever I discuss the four main biomolecules in terms of their structure and function, I always notice that the way I start off lipids is different from the other three biomolecules, and I think it has to do with these two words, varied structure. For example, when we discuss the carbohydrates, I mentioned that every single monosaccharide is supposed to have a carbonyl group. They should always have a lot of OH groups. That's universal. It's applicable for everything. And when we discuss proteins in the future and nucleic acids, it would be pretty much the same. But lipids don't have that property. You cannot group all lipids into one main structural feature. They are that different from one another. To add to that, not only do individual lipids have varied structures, they remain individual forever because we don't actually see lipids polymerized via permanent or covalent bonds. Unlike, for example, in carbohydrates, we can link to carbohydrates via glycosidic bond and it can happen for thousands and thousands of times. We will also see something similar to proteins and nucleic acids, but nothing like that in lipids. So now, if you ask, if they don't have structural or chemical similarity, maybe they have something else that's similar to them. And indeed, there is. All lipids are actually nonpolar which basically mean they don't have any charge or probably in organic chemistry terms, uh, they have nothing but carbons, but actually that's wrong because a lot of lipids have some oxygen with them. And one thing that we can take away from that is that since all lipids are nonpolar, then all of them must be pretty much insoluble or immiscible with water. Remember, water is polar. And if lipids are nonpolar, polar and nonpolar, hopefully uh, you would remember, do not mix. That's why whenever we use the word lipophilic for, let's say, a substance, or probably if you're a pharma major for a drug, okay, or any product, or any biomolecule, anything that's lipophilic is automatically hydrophobic, meaning water fear. They don't like water. They don't mix with water, and that's automatic. Or, accordingly, if you switch the uh, suffixes, anything that's afraid of lipid is likable or loves water, okay? And talking about classification, since we have already clarified that lipids have a lot of structural variety, you can just see uh, this mess right here, which had to happen because, again, we cannot group them together as one. So I think usually a lot of textbooks start with this question. Does the lipid that you have here fatty acid containing? Of course, the answers are yes or no. If the answer is yes, then you have what you call a saponifiable lipid. And I, of course, I know you have like one or two questions in mind. Wait, what's a fatty acid? And for some, they would follow up with the question, what's saponifiable? Which would be things we would discuss later. But let's f uh, move forward from this one. If I have a saponifiable lipid, what specific saponifiable lipid do I have? And actually, you would have to ask another question. Does it have glycerol or not? We will see the structure and importance of glycerol in the next discussions. But for now, if the answer is, yes, I have glycerol, you have two main options, the triglycerides and the glycerophospholipids, which is nice because the word glycerol is somewhat embedded in their names. If I don't have glycerol in my saponifiable lipid, then I have two main categories, or at least these, these are the ones in the textbooks, sphingolipids and waxes. Now, if you go back to the question and you answer no, there are no fatty acids, then we say non-saponifiable. And there are two main non-saponifiable lipid categories that we will discuss soon, the fat-soluble vitamins and the family of terpenoids, which actually include the sterols. Now, let's go to that question, or those two questions. First, what's a fatty acid? And second, what's saponifiable? And what does the word saponifiable have to do, or, uh, or what's the relationship of this with the word fatty acid? First, a fatty acid is actually, from taking from organic chemistry, a carboxylic acid, nothing more. The only thing that makes a carboxylic acid a fatty acid is that it should have a particular minimum length. Some textbooks actually mention that they can start from four carbons, but I think the, the safer one for me, and some textbooks start with this number, is six. And as you will notice later, as you will learn later, there are two main types, saturated and unsaturated, which kind of uh, rem uh, gives you a hint on these words. You should know what these are for future uh, discussion. Now, 
Given that we already know that a fatty acid is just a carboxylic acid, what does the word saponifiable mean with it? Or what does that, that have to do in relation with it? That requires us to review the process of saponification because this is actually a reaction that is discussed in basic organic chemistry. Saponification may use a carboxylic acid like this one, RCOOH, although you can see here, I mentioned a note here, the H can be replaced with an R. If I do that, I get something like RCOOR, and that's an ester. So I'm saying here that saponification can use a carboxylic acid or an ester. Now, before I continue, you may ask, why did I even need to mention an ester? Now, remember this. If I have glycerol, which is an alcohol, which is bonded to a fatty acid, a carboxylic acid, if you remember your organic chemistry, a combination of a fatty acid and an alcohol would usually result to an ester. That's why we can describe you know, triglycerides or glycerophospholipids as esterified lipids. That's why I had to say that regardless if you have a fatty acid alone or a fatty acid that's esterified to glycerol, they would react the same. And what's saponification again? What does saponifiable mean? That is, if you add a base like sodium hydroxide, what you would get are these products. One of them is water, and one of them is a salt that we actually call the salt, giving rise to the name of the reaction, saponification. And now, going back, where does the soap come from? Where does this come from? This one. And what's this? The fatty acid. So naturally, it would make sense that any fatty acid is saponifiable. Or if my lipid does not have a fatty acid, there's nothing to saponify. So it makes sense with the word non-saponifiable. And the next thing we would do is to actually, one by one, dissect the structure and function of these individual lipids.